Good morning, dear saints, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today's Monday, September 9th, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Today, our topic is Hosea. Picking up where we left off from last time, we are covering chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. In these chapters, or these verses, I should say, God speaks through the prophet Hosea. He's addressing Israel's unfaithfulness by using some vivid imagery. He likens the nation to an unfaithful wife, chasing after false gods and forgetting the covenant with him. Despite the people's betrayal, though, God warns of coming judgment, stripping away their prosperity and exposing their shame. Yet, underlying all these harsh words is a call for repentance because God desires to restore his people from their waywardness. Nice Strong Word is supported in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Whether it's a Bible story books for children or even Luther's small catechism or one of hundreds of other resources, LHF ensures that these materials are accessible in their native languages to communities in over 90 countries. Discover how they can support your ministry by visiting them online at lhfmissions.org. And while you're online, if something in today's discussion sparks a question or a thought, maybe a comment or even a correction, that's okay. I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me the best way is by email at thystrongword at kfuo.org. You can also find me more casually on X or on Facebook. My guest for this morning, welcoming back to the show, I am pleased to have the Reverend Rick Jones. He's a chaplain and the VP of Spiritual Life at the Dakota Boys and Girls Ranch in North Dakota. Good morning, Pastor Jones. Good morning. It's so good to be here. How is life going uh, there as a VP of Spiritual Life? But how are things going there at uh, the Dakota Boys and Girls Ranch? You know, it's it's going pretty well. It's back to school season, so the schedules always change and get a little more stable for us here as we're able to provide the school throughout the day, a little more uh, programming and, and structured time for those that we serve. And uh, we've got uh, exciting things happening. We just dedicated a new chapel at our mm. Bismarck location, and we have broken ground on a new psychiatric facility here on our Minot campus. So lots of exciting things happening here for Dakota Boys and Girls Ranch. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, I'm, I'm glad that the Lord is using you guys. Um, just a little bit, and we'll jump right into our text, but share with the folks at home who uh, may not be familiar with what you guys do, just sort of the 30-second elevator pitch. Uh, what, what kind of ministry is the Boys and Girls Ranch there? Sure, thank you. Uh, so Dakota Boys and Girls Ranch is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. We have a mission of helping at-risk children and their families succeed in the name of Christ. We do that primarily through our residential treatment centers, which we have in Minot, Bismarck, and Fargo, North Dakota. We also have an on-site school at all three locations that is able to provide fully accredited high school education um, with a lot closer to one-on-one -on -one student teacher ratio and the education provided in a way that meets and caters to the learning needs of those students. And we also have outpatient services, an outpatient clinic called Dakota Family Services that provides mental health counseling and clinical services for those in the communities. That's wonderful. Well, I'm so grateful for your ministry. I know a lot of families are positively impacted by what God is doing through you, but I'm glad that you've taken some time out of what I know is a busy schedule, even though everything's kind of settling down with school being back in session. But yeah, I know you're a busy guy, so let's get right to it. <laughs> Uh, go ahead and open us up, if you don't mind, with a word of prayer, and we're going to read about Hosea. Lord, as we gather around your word today in the book of Hosea, we ask that you be present for us. Help us to receive your wisdom and your blessings from this word, and allow us to uh, be impacted by it as the people you have called us to be. Bless us this day as we gather in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So Hosea is a fascinating book, um, and not just because some of the elements, especially here at the beginning, uh, I guess, friction against our Western and modern sensibilities, but sure. it's just another example of how God not only, I guess, has 
emotion, so to speak, for his people, right? He loves us. He cares right. for us. Things that kind of are, are part of the human experience. But, you know, God's emotions for us really does reflect that we are created in his image. There is a good place for emotions. But when he sends his prophets out, sometimes he really wants them to know how he feels. Uh, we often talk about we wanting God to know how we, uh, we feel. And, of course, we do have Jesus who is not unsympathetic to our weaknesses. But, yeah, it's just fascinating to see him say, my people are unfaithful to me, and I want yeah. you to really preach from a place of authenticity. Therefore, <laughs> as it famously says, go find yourself and take yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. Right. It's like, wow, God, right? So that's where that's kind of where, where we've gotten so far. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to, as I guess it was we lead in now to the chapter that we're facing, I want to take a couple verses, step back to verse 10 of Hosea. Because even though he has called uh, uh, Hosea to literally name two of his children at least, uh, Lo Rukama and Lo Ami, right? No mm -hmm, compassion, mm -hmm. no pity, not my people. Right. It doesn't mean that things are going to be like that forever. So I'm going to recall for the folks at home, verses 10, 11, and 1, and then we'll dive right in. So he does say, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head. And they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So all three kids' names are dropped there. Two of them are reversed. And then verse 1, which we actually did cover last time. Say to your brothers, you are my people. And to your sisters, you have received mercy. So brother, just in light of the background then, um, anything else you want to maybe uh, explain to set the stage for then what's going to come next? Because... You know, we kind of ended on lots of gospel last time. Yeah, it's a, a beautiful ending to the the chapter one there. And then, you know, verse, verse one of chapter two probably belongs with chapter one there as it sort of reverses. But as you said, yeah, just going back to Hosea's call, right? The ministry takes place from 740 to 715 BC. Uh, we know that from the kings of Judah that he lists, um, you know, Uzziah all the way down to Hezekiah. Um, and the only king from Israel that he mentions is Jeroboam II. I think that um, the reference to only Jeroboam II is tied into that other child's name, Jezreel. Uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. the idea that uh, this is the end of the kingdom. Uh, we don't need to recognize any other kings because it's done because of what was done to Jezreel, right? The, the next family kind of came in and took over and they're going to be brought to their destruction. Uh, the impending doom of the people is, is the background of which Hosea is sent to preach God's word. Yes, there's a lot of warning, but as the end of that first chapter reminds us, there's also hope. There is a calling back for God's people. There is mercy that can be had. Um, as we, we, we see what Hosea's life becomes, he is the embodiment. His whole life is, is an object lesson of how God interacts with his people. You know, he, you were, as you, you said, he's, he's commanded to take a, a wife who's a, a, essentially a prostitute, and his mm -hmm. children are going to be the results of that relationship. And he has to name them equivalently for what that relationship means. You're not my people. You, you keep leaving me. You keep abandoning me. Uh, you don't deserve mercy. That's, that's the children. And then again, the reminder of why it, it all comes down even into their political dealings with what happened to Jezreel. Uh, the other thing you can look at with Jezreel is it means God sows. So the background, sort of what he's laying the scene with, there's a covenant in the background and he's going to sow everything from the very beginning. He provides the place of grace. He provides the place of stability with that covenant. Uh, but there's also consequences when you violate a covenant, right? There's there's legal ramifications. And that's what we're going to see happen for the kingdom of Israel here before the end of Hosea's ministry even. 
as it's taken into exile by Assyria in 722. Um, but that's kind of the world in which Hosea is set, right? And his life is then used as the model um, of, of what God endures for his people. He is in a covenant relationship. He is in a marriage relationship with the people of Israel and Judah, and they keep violating that covenant. They keep walking away from it, but he is there as the faithful husband waiting to welcome them back. That's, that's what brings us into here. Um, that opening verse of the chapter brings that gospel resolution to what was set up in the first chapter, as, as you alluded to, you know, say to your brothers, you are my people showing despite the labels of Jezreel and Loami, there will be a welcoming back into the fold and they will once again be called God's people. And then telling the sisters, you have received mercy is that reversal of the no mercy name. And they will indeed be mercy for those who come back to God. And the rest of the section that we're going to get into today carries the same warnings as the names of Hosea's children, but this time it's applied specifically to Gomer, right? The unfaithful wife as the greater metaphor for Israel's relationship with Yahweh. Idolatry is often equated with adultery in the Old Testament. And for the book of Hosea, that metaphor takes center stage. Hosea's discussion of unfaithfulness from Gomer is really Yahweh pointing out the Israelite idolatry with the Canaanite gods, specifically Baal or Baal, how, or however you want to pronounce it. That's what we're going into, and he's really going to lay it out very clearly in this chapter. Now, that's the direction we're going to take for most of the show. I do yeah. want to take just a, I don't know if it's an excursus or not, but over to Romans. Uh, perhaps uh, you have that in mindset too, because in Romans, we have the, um, we have Paul uh, quoting right. uh, Hosea here. Uh, and the context in Romans is about the, the, I guess, the integration, so to speak, of the Gentiles into the promise. He says in Romans chapter 9, verse 23, uh, this is continuing the thought, of course. Um, well, let's do 22 then. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy? which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not my beloved, I will call my beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. A couple things I always like to point out is, I, this this is a sidebar, but I love how when the apostles, uh, especially Paul, uses the Old Testament, there there aren't like the uh, for folks at home there there isn't chapters and verses that didn't come around to like the fifteen hundreds. So he he just I love how he says it says somewhere in scripture, right. and then he kind of paraphrases it. And here he he kind of does the same thing. He just like as it says in Hosea. But he, he doesn't mangle the quote. He kind of conflates it with some of the stuff that comes later. But my yeah. point is, Paul seems to here, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, say that this is not only pointing forward to the redemption of those who are going to go into literal exile, but mm -hmm. the inclusion of people who once were called not my people. I, I think that's something worth pointing out. Do you, do you concur with that assessment? I think that's definitely a way, a way to go with it. Uh, from the very beginning, Israel was told to be that, that city of refuge, right? They were supposed to be a light to the nations, the ones that showed everyone what it was to have a right relationship with God, who the true God was, what it meant to be people of Yahweh. And as they, if they would have lived faithfully in that, it would have been that, that beacon of hope to bring all nations back to to a relationship with God. As it turned out, it kind of went the other way and God sent them into exile for their unfaithfulness. However, and I'll kind of get to this later, um, even into exile, there goes a faithful remnant, correct? And right. they then, even in that darkness of the nations, of the Gentiles, of the pagans, they will be that light of hope and peace and love that God has for all of the world. You know, interestingly enough, you talked about how this speaks 
both to the inclusion of the Gentiles, of course, but also the priesthood, really, of Israel to be that priest of God. You know, right. the inclusion of the Gentiles wasn't like a uh, a backup plan for God, right? This is part of God's will for us, uh, right. even from eternity. But we yeah, actually see this. I, I can't say it's being quoted because he actually doesn't quote it. But St. <laughs> Peter says exactly these words in the same kind of connotation that you were speaking of in First Peter chapter 1. He's speaking primarily to Jews, and he tells them to put away all malice. He tells mm -hmm. them about the uh, you are living stones being built up as a spiritual house. We hear all about that. Um, but this is after he also speaks very clearly in first Peter second uh first Peter two chapter ten verse ten. Sorry guys. He says this you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy, and then so beloved I urge you as sojourners and exiles, etc., to abstain from passions of the flesh. Uh, so he's he's making a bigger point here, but right. my point is that he also focuses on Hosea's words here, doesn't cite it, <laughs> but it, yeah. it's part of their language by this point, this promise of God, that yes, there is going to be consequences for rebellion on this earth, but mm -hmm. I'm not here to abandon you. Um, that famous Jeremiah passage, right? I know the plans I have for you. Right. Well, those plans are Jesus. And, right. and so we see that here too, I think. Yeah, ab absolutely. We, we see at least, again, if it is the, the use of the object lesson in the name of the children, this is part of Jezreel, right? God sows. He's, he's laying his plan out there. He's getting it ready to set into motion for the, 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 the hope that will be there, the gospel that will bring people back and, and bring people from all nations, but also the consequences, as we allude to, and we'll see in full force as the book goes on. Um, but that's all a part of what God sets in motion from the very beginning. He is a God of love, and that will play out the way he needs it to for the sake of his people. Well, let's see how the book gets on. I'm sure people are waiting for that. So in these next few verses, I'm just going to read two, but this is kind of the, the legal case being set out sure. uh, if this were a divorce proceeding. Uh, verse 2, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, after this wonderful turn about how where Israel is once disowned and unloved, God speaks mm -hmm. of this future where that will all be reversed and then immediately following. OK, now you need to talk to your mom. <laughs> right. Mom, of course, being Israel here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, directly for the for the prophet, you know, Gomer, if he's directing this, you know, to to his own children, we oh, can sure. see. The, the metaphor going on. But as you rightly stated, we're getting into that legal language. So right away, the plea with your mother, she is not my wife. I am not her husband. This is a clear reference to Israel's divorce laws. In Deuteronomy 24, it says, if a man finds something indecent about his wife, he can divorce her. This would often mean infidelity as it does here. But the system in place did allow for a man to divorce his wife, even for instances of childlessness, which is, you know, really sad to think about in the fuller scheme of things. But they mm -hmm. that was the system they had in place. In any case, uh, a certificate or contract of divorce needed to be supplied with witnesses. And this could happen with this same type of formulaic legal statement that Hosea presents. She is not my wife. I am not her husband. It also works to say, to show that he has already seen that as done if he's asking the children to plead on his behalf, right? That he's sending an intermediary to provide this information, almost like being served with papers, if we're going to keep that legal metaphor going. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of, yeah, it's what we're seeing here. It's alluding to Israel's divorce practices. Now, obviously, in our sinfulness, there would have been abuses to this system, but there would sometimes be stipulations put in place to deter 
uh, husbands from just being petty. They would often have to pay back a dowry or still provide in some way for the woman he was choosing to divorce. It wasn't as simple as a no-fault divorce or people just parting ways. So in this case, there's an opportunity for reconciliation, right? It's not just over and done. He says, lest I. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, we're going through with it unless this happens. So he's looking for the opportunity to present um, some reconciliation. If Gomer does not put away that adulterous behavior, it's done. But it, it can still it can still happen, right? She, it needs to be not evident in her face, meaning the outward actions. She needs to put away that behavior. But there's also a concession here that it asks for the adultery to be removed from the heart. Put it away from between your breasts. If the adulterous behavior is not stopped, the wife will be stripped naked, being compared to that barren desert piece of land. So in a marriage relationship in the ancient world, it was the husband's responsibility to provide for the wife. This was not just about food and shelter. It also referred to the things she needed in life, her clothing. And that's a symbol of the security, the dignity, and honor that comes with that relationship in that household. To remove those from the wife is to demonstrate the complete removal and denial of the relationship. And so that's what they're moving towards unless there is a change. You know, it's it's just fascinating. When we talk about it, like in the context of Gomer and Hosea, if we removed from it everything about God and his people and everything, right? We would we would say he has every no person. In fact, I don't even know of a pastor, uh, and, and we are rightfully against divorce, but nobody would look mm -hmm. at their situation and say, yeah, you know, um, you don't really have any grounds for divorce. No, everybody, even if we tried <laughs> to stave it off because we would want to, but right, everybody right. would kind of say in their heart, wow, you need to leave this lady. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And I think that's the point, right? Right. That's exactly She's it. She's supposed to be so egregious mm -hmm. so that we can see that when, when we get our atahish moment, you are the man moment, right? From yeah, Nathan yeah. pointing at us. When we realize yeah. that he's talking about us, that we go, Oh, yeah, I guess I am really, really bad. And you do have God every right to abandon me. And didn't, doesn't that just show us God's love all the more? Right. He's using uh, Hosea's actual life as an incredible and extreme drama to be the metaphor for God's relationship with his people. And we'll see all sorts of allusions to this and the details with which the, the life that uh, Hosea and Gomer are living is so parallel in the way in which God is there for his people and what his people are doing as they go after these, these idols. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot. Perhaps you not really thought about it, but uh, just out of curiosity, some of the scholars that I've encountered as I've studied Hosea, both in the past and for the episodes, uh, they talk about how some believe that just because of the drama that you talk about, mm. that this isn't a literal action that uh, that he was being called to, but rather more metaphorical. Uh, my previous guest, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, said that you know he believes it's true and he quotes scripture for it, uh, which is always good evidence. But I'm just curious, <laughs> have you thought about that? I mean, it, it logically speaking, it does really kind of chafe against our sensibilities. Like, why would God make somebody endure? what he's enduring, even for these reasons. So uh, do what do you see as the, as the tension there? Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I thought about that and, and I just think with the way it's presented and the other things we've, we've seen prophets do as they've been called, uh, I think it fits. Yes, it, it is an extreme and maybe we feel a lot of um, deep empathy for, for Hosea and what he goes through as far as that personal drama. But I mean, We've got prophets that lay on their side for a year. We've got, you know, the same prophet cooks meals over fecal matter and, and things like that. Right. Um, and then you go to the New Testament and, and Paul's words, you know, or the words to Paul, I will from from God, I will show you what you need to suffer, right? Um, and go through much pain, much hardship, and then all of those that gave their lives for the word. So I. I Yes, it's extreme if we're looking at it with that very, very human element. Uh, but a lot of times the, the actions in which 
God intervenes with people's lives for the sake of the word, for, for demonstrating his word. They are extreme. Uh, we had the plagues visited on Egypt and, and those were extreme. And here we have the, the full Abraham and Isaac. I can't help but right, think of, right, right. That's pretty right. extreme. Right. So I, I, I tend to think it, uh, it's, it's a real life that was lived, um, as an example of, of the gospel. Yeah, I, I, I lean that way too, and I think it's presented in that way. I think if it yeah. were more metaphorical, we would have more hints of it. I, I don't necessarily chastise anybody who might see it differently, but because the, the message remains the same. But with this said, though, I will say that um, as a pastor, um, I can empathize with folks like Hosea, and, and you mentioned Paul. He suffered a lot, and he didn't just suffer because you know he was getting his rear end whooped outside the city. He suffered out of uh, an emotional connection, a love for his people. And so yeah. I think whenever we ourselves individually or the congregation uh, betray the Lord in our sins, um, it's sometimes hard for us to see that. But I do know that a lot of pastors, they'll see maybe a little rebellion in the congregation or people who <laughs> – betray him in some way. And right. it just hurts so much more than say, if it was just somebody at work that didn't like you, it, it, it's, it feels more like a betrayal because we really do kind of pour out a lot of our lives for people. And then to be turned against, especially for something silly, uh, yeah. can be really hurtful. Now I'm grateful this hasn't, ex I haven't experienced this in quite a while, but I certainly have experienced it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's true. Those that um, are called to deliver the word, see the, the ups and downs of, of real lives that have been impacted by sin. We are there with people in the messiest parts of their lives. Um, but the flip side of that is when the spirit is active and the word is uh, brought to its, its full harvest, we get to see the most joyous and incredible moments of people's lives as well. And so there's a lot of that. And, and again, yeah, Lives that are impacted by sin are lives that are filled with emotion, both positive and negative. God is a God of love, and that is how deep love goes. And so everywhere the word is is doing its thing, we should expect to see these great dramas, these great swings of, of positive and negative. That's, that's the working of law and gospel as it, it plays out in people's lives. Indeed. All right, folks, we're going to head to break. When we come back, we'll keep on going, picking up with verse 4 in Hosea chapter 2. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo, and with me today is the Reverend Rick Jones. He is chaplain and vice president of spiritual life at the Dakota Boys and Girls Ranch in North Dakota. As we jump back into the discussion, remember that line is open. Thy Strong Word at KFUO.org is the best way you can reach out to me. You can also reach out to me on X or Facebook. Uh, somebody did, Becky from St. Louis, she writes, and I've uh, trunked, truncated some of this. She says, hi, Pastor Boo. I listen to Thy Strong Word as a podcast. That's great, folks. You can listen to it as a podcast over the air when it's live or live at KFUO.org. She says, I saw your blue Jesus Loves You billboard on the side of the freeway. That's right. That's I-90 right outside of Laverne, uh, St. John Lutheran Church here, the congregation that I'm ple ple uh, pleased to serve. They have a big sign. Uh, it predates me. It says, Jesus loves you. Big blue one. I'd like to get that updated, actually. It's getting a little old in the tooth. But try to tell folks that Jesus loves them. She saw it. Jesus does love her. 
Uh, she says, I learned so much from thy strong word, but I'm far behind in listening. I'll be farther behind due to a trip I'm on. I'm listening. Uh, you just started Amos. <laughs> okay, well, good. Enjoy Amos. Uh, but you won't actually hear that, I guess, until you get to this one. So anyway, thanks for writing in, <laughs> Becky. All right. Well, uh, let's get back to it, brother. Uh, so we pick up now, and the, the children are mentioned, but the issue, of course, is still Gomer specifically, right. but uh, <clears throat> more virtually the people of Israel. Starting with verse 4. Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. Okay, so um, that's the middle of verse seven. Uh, the, yeah. Well, you know what? Let's go ahead and finish it out. So sure. then she says, it, uh, I will go and return to my first husband for it was better for me then than for now. Okay, I kind of wanted that to drop after we talked about it. But <laughs> so it, the point, of course, is in the excommunication, so to speak, that you will return. He's not trying to ditch her. He's trying to have her return. But still... This is a, it's, it's kind of like you knew she was a snake when you picked her up. He told right. her to marry this right. woman, and now here she is uh, betraying him. Uh, what does this say about, of course, not only Hosea and Gomer, but God's people and us today? Well, yeah, I think the mention of the children right off the bat there, tying it back to that relationship that has been broken and violated, the trust is gone, right? Um, so dependence and provision that is provided from a husband to a wife it also extends to the children. The wife, in this case, Gomer, has violated the marriage so completely that even the children are lo no longer seen as legitimate. If her faithless, or excuse me, if her faithfulness is in doubt, then so is the fathering of her children. So the act is so shameful it reflects on the next generation, and this is true of other sins as well. Right? Children learn from their parents, and the choices of a parent have consequences that can impact the following generations talk about generational sin. We even see it in the patriarchs, right? Abraham lies about his wife and who she is as they're traveling. And then his, his son does the same thing. And we see those sorts of dishonest things keep going. Um, you could say the same of, of Jacob, you know, the deceiver. Uh, his mother was the one that put him up to it, right? And it seems to follow. There's all these sorts of things. Um, but we see that. We see the generational consequences of sin. And I think this is what's described at the close of the Ten Commandments when God says he punishes sins to the third and fourth generation of those who break his commandments. But there too, if the sin is repented of, there's a way back. And the people that return to the Lord, there is love for a thousand generations of those who love the Lord and follow his commands. So yes, socially, uh, there are definitely consequences for our choices. But one of those choices is to repent, right? To see what the word is doing in our lives and, and return to God. And there can be positive consequences there. Uh, but this case in Gomer situation, her infatuation with sin has her so thoroughly enslaved that she does not even know where her support and provision is coming from anymore. She thinks it is the lovers who are providing for her, but that was never the case. Sin this deep and this destructive has severe consequences, socially, emotionally, physically, yes, spiritually. And unless there is that true repentance, it will be eternal. But for the Israelites, this meant they had lost sight of the power of Yahweh and were looking to Baal for everything they needed. He was taking over and God's desperately trying to call them back through the words of the prophet. But it seems to be falling on deaf ears. Just thinking of some of the specifics, you talked about the children in this case being uh, so sinful, so wayward that they're as if they aren't legitimate. Uh, some scholars contend that while Jezreel is clearly the child of Gomer and Hosea, that perhaps the other two are not. Maybe it came from her unfaithfulness, uh, and that's part of the imagery here. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know how you feel about that. 
I mean, it's definitely a possibility. I don't know that mm-hmm. we would have any way to say for sure, uh, <laughs> sure, but that's definitely tied in again to the idea that if this is her behavior, then we have to doubt even the the uh, the legitimacy of those children. We don't know for sure, and I think that's part of um, sort of the, the the pain and the consequence of this type of action. If our idolatry is that strong, then even the things we teach to our children. Are they going to understand what is what is faithful worship or not? You know, aside from the question of, you know, is this fair because of God not only commanding him to marry uh, yeah. home, uh, home, uh, sorry, Comer, uh, that that he also knows that she's going to be uh, not faithful. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, then she still gets punished for it. It, it. But if we take a step back, we realize that this really isn't Hosea saying it. It's God saying it to his people. But even there, God says that his intent is to hedge up Israel's path with thorns, to like keep yeah. her from reaching her idols. So I really get this vision here that, that, that God's discipline is a lot like placing know, barriers on a dangerous road. You know, he's, we feel like you're limiting us from what we want to do which frankly, much of which is unfaithful, mm-hmm. but he stops Israel from going further into idolatry by this action. But Israel's going to, you know, he's, they're going to, they're going to kick back at this just as we do. We often mm-hmm. think of even God's law or even the consequences of our dumb decisions, um, perhaps which God wants us to learn from. We say, wow, it just doesn't feel like life's fair. But regardless of our perspective, I think it's important to keep in mind that just as here, God is, when he keeps us from things that even we think might be good, it's always for our good. He knows better. Right. It's a, it's a part of discipline, right? We, we discipline our children out of love. Um, sometimes they don't like that and they want to rebel against it, but we're, we're doing, we set those boundaries and those barriers to show them what is right and good. Now, obviously any parent knows that, we are not a perfect solution for that, uh, and the rebelliousness, in this case, the the sinfulness, is is going to get around some of those things. But I think um, this idea of the walling up, the hedging, it's the consequences for continued unfaithfulness in this case. So the adulteress will be hedged in, closed off from being able to get to her lovers. She will seek them more and more, but she will not be able to get to them. I think as the husband is taking his provision back that's been mistakenly attributed to the lovers. This is uh, showing a little bit of that being handed over to your sin, right? Now the, the fulfillment and the pleasure that she thought she had will be replaced by desperation and anguish. We, we, we hear about God handing the people over to their sins as a, a, a way of last last resort for helping them to see the seriousness of their actions. You, you alluded to excommunication. That's, that's what we have here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have acted in such a way that you are no longer a part of this community. Um, we're doing this because we have no other option. We're doing this out of love because we're concerned for your, your soul, for your safety, for all of it. And you, you need to learn from this. And that the hope is in that, uh, that uh, sort of release releasing of her or, or separating her from those things it, it'll it'll bring about the the proper attitude of, of repentance you you bring up an issue too and and you talk about how um of course israel is not recognizing that the good gifts of god are coming from god she thinks it's from her own efforts through her relationships with idols uh, yeah. to speak generically enough so that we can understand that this is talking about the people of Israel and yeah. it even talks about us today. Um, but the divorce part, right? Or even the excommunication yeah. part. Yeah. One of the fascinating things that I learned a long time ago is about our church fellowship practices in the LCMS. Uh, regardless of whether you think they're too strict or whatever, th- the point is someone said, I don't know if it was President Harrison or someone else, but they said something to the effect of, we don't like declare uh fellowship with people or we don't you know we don't choose like okay now we're in fellowship with you mm-hmm. fellowship is something that we recognize that right. is we might work together till we are in fellowship but it's not a matter of okay we like you so we're going to be in fellowship with you it's a matter of observing what you believe teach and confess and either 
recognizing that we are in fellowship or not. And it makes it seem so simple, but I guess it kind of is. Same thing with excommunication. People don't say we don't. I mean, they might say because we're sinners, but it's not (laughs) that people should say, well, we don't like you, so we're going to kick you out. Right. It's more of a acknowledging that you are now not with us and therefore you either need to stick to that path which means you're excommunicated you're no longer a communicant member you're not you're not yeah. in communion with us or you need to realize that you need to change your ways so same thing here right. I, I, right. I had a couple a long time ago over a decade ago I had a couple come in and they were having some marital troubles you know marital troubles are a part of life uh, but they basically hated each other <laughs> just to Aww. make it really clear And they had not slept in the same room in 20 years. They had not even kissed or held hands in 20 years. And as I'm talking to them, I recognize that they were divorced. Hmm. But they were still living in the same house because God doesn't like divorce. And I said, but the thing that God doesn't like has already occurred. You're talking about paperwork. You're talking about whether or not you want to go and file the paperwork. Now, I don't want you to. I want you to reconcile. But after 20 years of not being married, it, the paper doesn't make you marry. In the same way, and this is my studies for my PhD right now, in the same way that just being on a membership role doesn't really make you a member of a church. That Those words mean something. Right. So same here. You are my wife. That means something. You are my children. That means something. And so when he recognizes that his wife is not being a wife, it's not that he's kicking her out so much as he's just saying, we're divorced. I'm right. not your, you're not my wife and I'm not your husband. Right. He's acknowledging what she has declared with her actions. Oh, yes. Yes. All those words that you summed up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's precisely it, though. He's just recognizing what she's decided. It's, it does that not, brother, remind us of faith. Many yep. people will reject Christ, but then we can't sort of moan and lament. Well, why doesn't God save them? They don't want it. I mean, that's not the case for everybody, but that is a case for a lot of folks. Right. It, it comes down to, you know, the big question, well, why, why does God allow all of this bad stuff to happen? Why, why does sin, why does he allow sin to continue and have consequences for people? Because if he, he didn't, it wouldn't be love. Right? He, he, he loves us enough to allow us to reject his grace. It is yeah, all a free tough. gift. It's there, but he allows us to say no. That's the depth of his love, and it's it's heartbreaking. You already brought up the fact that they had forgotten God and that he's the source of all good gifts, but we actually didn't read those verses. I'm going to add in where we're getting that from. Verse 8, God continues, And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used. For Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Mm. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. Uh, just pausing there. So, I know people who have been divorced, and this verse 8, I think anyone who's endured a bitter divorce from unfaithfulness can empathize with both Hosea and, of course, our Lord. Mm -hmm. She didn't know it was I who gave her all these good things and lavished these good things on her, but she used them for but all. I mean, just to speak really concretely, folks, think about your loved one, your husband, your wife, and all the things that you did good for her or vice versa, or for your husband, if you're a woman, all the things you did good, they then took all that money, all that love, and basically repaid it to someone else. Right. I mean, obviously, that's, that's, it's, it's more than a betrayal. It, it's just excruciating. I, 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 we don't like to think of those things, but if we can just get them in our head for half a second, it gives us a minute uh, idea of what God really does feel about us. For I mean, that's really how he cares about us. I think that's amazing. I, it really just shows not only the amazingness of God's love, but but frankly, why would we ever want to be unfaithful to someone so faithful to us? Yeah. Yeah, no, this, this section, you know, verse 8 especially, it's alluding to how deluded 
sin can make us. So in this case, the, the adulteress is so misguided that she thinks all of these things are coming from the lovers when they're not. And so in the case of Israel, uh, Israel is so lost that they're in their idolatry that they, they've lost sight of Yahweh as the Lord of all creation and the source of all provision. They had replaced their trust in the God who delivered them from Egypt, the God who cared for them in the wilderness, the God who gave them the promised land with now a trust in Baal, a, a Canaanite storm God or a rider of the clouds. I think we can see where they got there. You know, Israel is primarily an agricultural society. They're, they'd be drawn to the deity who could bring the rain, right? That makes sense. And from there, it becomes a natural extension to think of the one providing fertile fields as the one who would also bring about overall fertility, whether that's for families or economics or whatever you need. And so the false worship of Baal quickly became the means and the source for the people's daily bread. And the sad irony here is they're now using the provisions and the blessings from the true God to pay homage to and even cast, create those false gods, those idols of wood and stone that they're, they're draping and adorning with the precious metals and the gifts that God has given them. And then it goes even further, What's and this gets into the big metaphor here of the adultery, what's more devious than just that, that subtle nudging of the theological thinking into those terrible rituals. The rituals with Baal are connected to ceremonial or what they would consider sacred prostitution. It was commonplace for the worship of Baal. And Hosea's metaphor here becomes not just a visceral rhetoric. It's the literal reality of Israel's betrayal. They're violating God's covenant as an adulterer violates their marriage vows. Let's add just a few more verses. Sure. These are the last verses of our section for today. We're only going through verse 13, picking up with 12. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals, when she burned offerings to them, and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers, and forgot me, declares the Lord. So when we talk about the, the Lord, Yahweh, mm -hmm. God, is mm -hmm. a jealous God. Uh, this isn't jealous and sinful human jealousy. Um, I, I've, I've often shared this with folks. It's worth sharing again. right? So envy is to want something that someone else has. Jealousy is to be afraid someone's going to take what you have. But God, in very righteous ways that we probably can't imitate, is jealous of his people. He doesn't want to share us with false gods that are really nothing and will lead nothing to, but to our demise. Yeah. Yeah. So hip, God there again, removing all of the blessings that had been bestowed. He's, he's stripping away all of the, the adornments, all of the things that have been put on as, as these, these false shows, a, a wrongful use of his gifts. And it's revealing not just the, the, the sin that is underlying there, but it's, it's making what they're trying to do ineffective. So for the, the case of the adulteress, by removing all of her, her jewelry, by removing her clothing, by removing all of the, the gifts and stuff that she has to, to throw at her lovers, she makes herself or she's now becoming from the removal of, of the grace, the removal of the blessing, she's becoming undesirable to those lovers. So for Israel, as God removes his provision from them, they no longer have the resources to perform those false rites of, of seeking favor from Baal. They can no longer even do the, the, the pagan rituals that they, they thought they were getting benefit from. It's reversing the whole situation. They can't, they can't have it both ways, and God is showing them that. In uh, the prophet Nahum, in Nahum 3, 5, uh, he says, Behold, I am against you, declares Yahweh of hosts, hmm. and will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. So <laughs> we have this sort of language of shame and yeah. even humiliation. 
we live in a culture where no one is supposed to ever feel any shame because no matter what you do or don't do or think or don't think, then that's your truth, no matter how uh, wholesome or how deviant it may or may not be. Uh, you know, to, to, to make someone feel bad is almost the ultimate sin in our secular religion. But right. there's a there's a role, there's a good role that shame should play, right? Not that we should willingly humiliate people. That would be absolutely taking the wrong message. But that in our own sins, we should be embarrassed if those things were revealed to the world. That That tells us that we know they are wrong. Yeah. Yeah, we should be aware of these things. We need to be shown what behavior is inappropriate. Um, I think uh, we see the the big sort of contrast between the the religion of of the pagans, the the original religion of idols, and the religion of the faithful worship of Yahweh, as he's talking about the the feasts and festivals. Right, that's where there shouldn't be shame in those festivals. There should be this, this joy in the celebration. And as he strips everything away, uh, they're, they're, they're losing even that. So all the joy, all the frivolity of the rituals, the ceremonies and celebrations are going to dry up as the truth of the idolatry is revealed. So the feasts and festivals of, of Baal are hollow imitations of the feasts and ceremonies that were established by God. All the holy days set aside by Yahweh are about his service and grace for the people. Right. The Passover is about God's deliverance of the people uh, it, from slavery in Egypt. Pentecost is rooted in thanksgiving for the provision of the harvest. The Sabbath is about people resting and being refreshed as they dwell without labor in God's grace. They simply receive. And then even the sacrificial system that was set up for, by in Leviticus, it's about guilt and consequences being provided in the stead of the person who committed the sin. The pagan festivals were the complete opposite. Right? The worshipers are called on to serve and sacrifice for the gods, not the other way around. Worship of Baal was an empty uh, attempt to, to win or earn favors from those balls, not simply to receive the blessings provided for them out of the Lord's hand the Lord of creation's hand. It's his overwhelmingly gracious gifts that, that provide all these things. And so as he's sort of reestablishing or, or re stating for them what the right relationship is supposed to be, everything is, is stripped away and they see, they can see um, the reality of where they stand. Um, uh, uh, one little Quick note I think we can make here is it switches to plural for, for ball in 13. Uh, and I think this is an allusion to the full pervasiveness with which this type of worship had had happened, specifically with this this character, this this um, Canaanite deity of Baal. It was in everything. His name became shorthand for almost any deity, or at least it's connected to to most of them. Uh, we we kind of shorthand God for Yahweh, Baal had kind of become that title versus a name. There are records of, of Baal being merged with local deities and cultural deities. There's inscriptions to Baal Peor and Baal Lebanon and Baal Sidon. It is probable that in the height of the Israelite idolatry, as they become so deluded and so perverted in what they're doing, some of them were probably performing rites to Baal Yahweh. They're perversely thinking they're still worshiping the God of their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But because it has been so ingrained in their culture in that backward and wrong way, they, they, they don't even understand. They've forgotten the true identity of their Hosea, right? Their salvation or deliverance. That's what his name means. Gomer's adorning herself to be attractive to the lovers as Israel's engaging with those pagan rites to appear worthy as of favors from Baal. And it's completely the opposite of what God is asking of them. Mm. Well, and since that was indeed what they were doing, this is a very apt description. They have divorced right. themselves from their God. They're not acting like they should. God, of course, is faithful. He wants yes. to see them return to. Folks, I, as we're going to end it today, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Rick Jones, chaplain and vice president of spiritual life at the Dakota Boys and Girls Ranch in North Dakota. Thanks, for brother, for being on the show. Absolutely. I uh, really appreciate being here. 
I, I think just a, a closing thought, if what we should get from this is even in the height of our unfaithfulness to that, that covenant language, that covenant relationship, that contract relationship, God remains faithful. There is always a remnant. There is always hope. Even in exile, there were faithful people. And we can all have that, that, that faith and that trust in God. There will be uh, a way back. There's always repentance. There's always mercy. When we struggle, he is faithful and he is always there for us. Indeed. I mean, we ended our section today with a little heavy dose of God's law. It's going to go on and convict the people of Israel, but it convicts us today right. too. Right. I, you know, if we kept reading though, you'd think, oh, it's, it's got to get worse. Well, here's the very <laughs> next verse. He says, therefore, behold, uh oh, what's he going to do? Mm -hmm. I will allure her and I will bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. That's what we're going to talk about yes. tomorrow, friends. Hosea 2, we're going to finish it up with guest pastor John Lekomsky. But it's all about God's mercy now to Israel and Hosea's reconciliation with Gomer. It's a roller coaster, friends. Join us tomorrow, same time. But until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all. As we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong hands.